Hello everybody. This place is absolutely massive. I had no idea it was going to be so big. So I'm going to jump right into it. This is <coughs> 10 things that can kill your idea in AAA development. So I'm going to start with a couple of disclaimers. This is a, an, a intentionally provocative title. So first of all, I'm not going to go through like thing one, thing two, thing three, etc. We're going to talk about a lot of different stages in development and a lot of different considerations and strategies that are at play. And uh, at the end, we'll talk a bit of summary, but uh, this is essentially just uh, a way of getting you in the door. Everyone wants to have, you know, the three ways to make your game successful, the five ways to get abs. This is the 10 things that kill your idea. And the next thing to talk about is what, in this context, is an idea. So. We're not talking about full game ideas, although I do feel that some of this stuff is going to be relevant to full game idea pitching. It's more about if you're on a team, in a larger team, and you're pitching to that team or your leads what, an idea that you want to put into the game that you're making, which is a common situation for a lot of us. Another thing is that, uh, as you all know, in AAA development especially, the teams are so large and you're all working together that it's a collaborative effort and it's difficult to call any one idea yours, especially after it starts and people start contributing to it. So, although I'm using the term your idea here, and then often people are responsible for owning and selling and curating an idea, chances are that these ideas aren't purely yours. It's not a purely selfish thing. We're all working together to make this game. So this could be a collaborative idea, but for the purposes of the talk, it's your idea or my idea. And finally, uh, I put the disclaimer here, AAA development, I always do this, because I had never worked in independent gaming before. I know a lot of you are uh, indie developers. And I never worked there, so I'm not sure how much of this is relevant to you. But I do have a suspicion that probably quite a lot of it is still relevant. And at the end, if it does resonate with you, even though you're not in AAA, I'd love to hear from you. So welcome to some things that can kill an idea or suggestion you have for an existing game in AAA or potentially in development, a less catchy title. OK, so step one, who am I? I my name is Stephen Thornton. Nice to meet you. I'm a lead game designer at a company called Sparasoft currently. Before that, I worked at Traveler's Tales on the LEGO video game series. And I made a lot of them in various design roles. I started off there just as a, as a, a junior game designer and then climbed the ladder all the way up to game director. Moved to Sparasoft, where now I'm working crew development on products such as uh, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, which I worked on for two years, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I worked on a little bit briefly with an existing team that uh, Sparasoft had running on it. I'm currently working on a very exciting game that I was really thinking I could tell you about today, but it's not quite announced yet. So unfortunately, it is a question mark. But uh, it's very, very cool. And uh, if you keep track of the Sparrow social media and my Twitter media accounts, you will eventually have it revealed to you. OK, so let's jump into the topic. Uh, Sparrowsoft, uh, the company I'm working for currently, works in co-development. So I'm working on uh, well, a current secret project. We work with very large publishers and partners throughout the game industry. Although you may not have heard of Sparrowsoft itself, I'm sure you've heard of many of our big partners. Games these days are collaborative, not just inside a single studio, but internationally, a lot of studios working together. Sometimes they're all under one umbrella. Sometimes they're all working together from different studios based across the world. As you can see here, we've got a lot of big games and a lot of big partners in development currently. If you want to hear more about us, swing by the Keywords booth at B3 on floor one. And uh, I should be there for an hour after this presentation also. All right, so swinging back to the topic things that kill your game idea. So the good news is, in AAA, you'll have a lot of opportunity to pitch your ideas, to have ideas and suggest them to the team and try and get people to make your stuff. Although many of my ideas haven't made it to a game, many of them have. And working in a AAA team is extremely exciting because you've made it in, and chances are your fingerprints will be on some of the biggest games that are appearing in, in shelves today. The bad news is, there are a lot of things that when you have an idea, will potentially affect, kill, or maim your idea beyond recognition before it hits the shelf. There is a recurring theme here of the meteor 
in this presentation. This refers to a kind of analogy that me and a previous colleague used to joke about, which is that getting an idea into a video game is like throwing a meteor at a planet, and the atmosphere gradually burns it down until eventually you'd be lucky if a mere pebble is what hits the surface. Coincidentally, uh, the pebble is the power bank shape that we're giving away to the best question tonight, the aforementioned competition. Uh, that is just a really lucky little coincidence. So in this, I'm going to be talking about how when you have an idea, what can damage it, what is it where, is, where is it at risk, and the strategy that you can put in place in order to protect that idea from these things that can change it. So where do ideas die? Almost always in a meeting room. Got some laughs there, good stuff. And who kills them? Other people. Now, I don't want to be overly negative. Obviously, other people can also improve your idea, but if you're working by yourself, no one would stop you taking an idea all the way to the finish line. Chances are, if your idea is going to get changed or killed in your development, it's going to be by someone else interfering in your idea. So, meeting rooms tend to be where those people are when they kill the idea, but what makes a meeting room so dangerous? They don't make any sense. When you walk into a meeting room to do your proposal and your pitch, I often have no idea what the outcome is going to be whenever you leave that meeting room. The, there's kind of an irrational process at work in the meeting room, a lot of different uh, failures of, of, of uh, sense. For example, in a meeting room, it tends to be about satisfying all the people present in that room at the time. I've had meetings go a completely different direction because one key person, a stakeholder, was absent that day or because they were uh, in a different meeting room and it completely changed the trajectory of the conversation. Additionally, uh, the more people who support an idea, the more successful it tends to be. Majorities win in a meeting room, and just because five people out of six think an idea is good doesn't necessarily mean it is the best idea for the game at that time. Uh, additionally, everyone in the meeting room tends to have something that they want, and it's not always something that is for the game. Often people have development agendas. For example, perhaps they've got a large team and they're going to lose some team members if they don't give them work, so they might have an agenda of seeking more work. Maybe they're unhappy with the amount of debugging that's building up for the end of the game, and they're looking for features that don't have a bunch of un unexpected bug fixing at the end, so they've got an agenda in that way. Maybe they're looking to put some groundwork down for a future system they want. <laughs> that they want to make. So you have to keep in mind what people in the room actually want, uh, aside from just making a good game. Unfortunately, that's not always the goal at play. It's not an insidious thing. We all need different things to make our working life easier and to help our, uh, our own development ideas forward. But keep in mind that when you go in there, not everybody's looking to get the best outcome for the product. Some of them need other things to help them with their team. Also, there needs to be pressure in the meeting room to come to a decision, to leave the room, which can lead to a lot of knee-jerk choices. It also means that in that room, if someone says something, that they tend to just, it tends to be a fact in that room. No one has time to go away and confirm that it's wrong. So for example, if you're picking a, a new feature and someone says, that sounds like it's going to slow the game down, it's going to be bad for performance, or someone says, that sounds like it's going to take a long time to load, there's no actual research being done yet, but there's also no time to do any. So that becomes a fact, a negative thing that you have to kind of work with as you're developing the idea in the room. And another little logical fallacy at play is that new ideas or new solutions tend to sound smarter than old information. Whenever an idea has been bouncing around the room for a long time or has been in development for a couple of weeks or months, whenever a fresh idea comes along, it can feel like you know, the new hotness in town. It feels smarter because it's fresher. And that's kind of just a little thing that humans have. They think a new idea tends to be better than an old one, when in fact sticking to the original plan might be wiser. And the thing that feels the smartest of all is an idea that came from the creative jazz of the room. You're throwing ideas back and forth, you're adding things to it, adding your fingerprints. And as you go, uh, that idea builds up. And as it's bounced around and collected a little piece of ideas from all of you, the room thinks, this is a really clever idea. This is, this is a genius for working here. After all, isn't that the entire point of collaborative game development, that we all add something to an idea? So an idea that, it has, uh, that is new and has combined things from a lot of different people can feel a lot more valuable than it actually is. And for all these reasons and a million more, uh, a meeting room is a very unsafe place for you to bring an idea into. You don't know what people want, you don't know what they're thinking. They might be, uh, misunderstand what you're pitching and be misled in another direction that may be tainted by uh, unfortunate negative uh, ideas that aren't even being checked to be if they're true or not. And it could be that because you've pitched an idea to people who don't have time to research it, they're giving you estimations that are too inflated just to protect themselves from potential overtime or crunch later. So there's a lot of things uh, in a meeting room that make it kind of random what happens in there. 
Uh, whenever I'm taking a uh, proposal to a meeting room, it's my, my, my most tensest. Even more nervous than I was before I saw this room. So, if you're going to get through this process, before you, you bring your idea to, to the meeting room, the first thing you've got to do is to pitch it. Thank you. To pitch it. Uh, and for me, uh, this should be a natural thing for game designers. All game designers have to sell their ideas constantly. In AAA, there's many layers and stakeholders involved in a company, and you have to constantly be selling your idea, explaining why it is good and why does the game need it. Uh, a, lot, a mistake that a lot of people make is that they know that in order to sell something, you have to know what your audience is and work out what they need and give it to them. But a lot of people don't misunderstand when pitching an idea, game designers especially. They think they're pitching the best idea for the game, but in fact, if you want to get your idea through a meeting room, you're actually pitching the room, the meeting room of stakeholders. So I've always been uh, subscribed to the philosophy that there aren't that many objective good and bad choices in game design because everyone's got different goals and ideas. It's a subjective thing. We're all, we're all creatives. So, for example, some people might be on uh, the Gears of War team and they don't like Gears of War. Some people don't like Mario Brothers. Some people don't like the Beatles. There's a lot of things that have been very successful that aren't everyone's cup of tea. And whenever you've got a large team of people, chances are some people won't be on board with the goal everyone else is chasing. And as a result, uh, it's hard for one idea to be definitively the right thing to do, especially this early stage whenever it's not developed yet. So whenever you are pitched to that room, there are some things you can do to prepare yourself. So step one, get some information. So I mentioned earlier that there's no time for research in the room. So any facts that you need to defend yourself from uh, negativity should be brought with you to the room. If possible, just get some very rough uh, solutions to the most likely problems. I mentioned earlier about loading times and frame rate. If you can just go to an engineer and get a comparative uh, feature and compare roughly uh, how that performs or go out to previous projects or other games and work out that that's not going to be a problem. Then whenever someone in the meeting room says, what about the frame rate? What about the loading time? You can just sort of say, don't worry, I checked it out and that isn't an issue. So try and get ahead of those things. You can kind of almost always kind of work out with your idea where the controversy is, where the risk is. So wherever you can get information to kind of allay that risk in the room, do so. If someone was to say yes to you, what would be your first steps? What would you require? Because one thing that can stop an idea happening is how much resources does it demand. Even if everyone agrees that it's the best idea ever, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to be possible with the time and resources you have. So if someone said to you, like, all right, go away and do it, who do you need? It's important you're prepared for that, that question. Have some phases in mind. Have a, a first step you can, you can give to the room. If possible, proof of concept. Uh, if you just bring an idea verbally, uh, the mental canvas of everybody in the room could be painted with a different picture. It's very difficult for everyone but who has their own frame of reference in their life and the media they consume to picture the same thing when an idea is brought to them. So if possible, bring an image of it, bring an example, have something they can cling to and be on the same place that you are. Uh, it also tends to give some value to the idea that something's already been made. So if possible, try and set that stage yourself. Uh, before the meeting also, something I tend to do uh, is go around and talk to people who are going to be there, get their thoughts early. People tend to be less confrontational one-on-one, -on -one, more open to ideas, more open to giving their solutions before the room. Uh, this can become a very political thing, so of course make sure you're not playing politics or making any enemies there. But generally, if you know the team and you know who's going to have concerns or interest in this idea, go around and work out what the reaction is going to be before the meeting actually happens. That will make the meeting room less of a surprise when you go in. Whatever you're selling, uh, again, this is more of a salesman thing. I think it should come very natural to a lot of game developers and is also very relevant if you're pitching a full game idea, is to basically create the context that your idea is going to exist in. So, for example, if you know the team is low on animators, then you know you can sort of say, this is a low animation cost thing. This is an idea we can do without that kind of workload. So the narrative when you're selling your idea is keeping in mind who is in the room and what state the game is in currently, the team is in currently, what is the angle, the narrative, the direction you're going to sell it from? So for example, if I wanted to sell the ability to make uh, a train editing tool for the team to use, I could sell it to the tech team by saying, if you make this tool, then you won't have to do any manual engineering updates all the time. The designers will take care of it for you. I can sell it to the publishers by saying, now you're going to have open world levels, larger levels at the back of the box. I can sell it to the level design team because I can say, well, now you can make your levels faster. Everyone sees the same tool differently. So you find the angle that your audience wants. 
Uh, a thing that people tend to do now in AAA is to have what they call core pillars. This can take the different forms. Uh, for example, they have the, uh, the, some people do the one sentence. For example, uh, over at Ed, I saw a documentary where they said their one sentence was shotguns versus demons, and that was the, the, the sentence they used to guide the entire game. Anything that benefited that sentence was used. At Ubisoft, they have the fantasy. What is the fantasy the player is experiencing? And basically, anything that feeds back into that core goal is positive. It's for the game. It lets it cut through some of that subjectiveness I mentioned earlier. So if at the start of the meeting, you establish what is the core goals for the game, and further, what is the goal of this meeting? And you know that your, and your narrative, that your idea is a solution to the problem you're raising. So you get to ask the question and provide your own answer at the same time. And finally, kind of rolling back into narrative, once the meeting starts going, keep track of what people in the room are asking for. What do they want? People tend to be, you know, they want you to know what they want so you can give it to them. They might not be able to see the opportunities that you do, but keep in mind what people are asking for. You know, do they want more time? Do they want more game content? Do they want to be able to have more control over something? And keep a look at what, how your idea could be potentially bent to fit that audience. So how can you make your idea more attractive to other people? This used to be a huge list of ways you could do it, but it was distracting on the screen, so I removed it and I memorized it. There's a bunch of things you can do. For example, as I mentioned earlier, you can make it so it benefits the game in terms of setting technology that can be used later. So you're putting down some groundwork that will be expanded upon in future projects. You could say that it's going to, although it's going to take a long time up front, in the long term it's going to benefit development. You could show how it will benefit uh, reducing the workload of certain departments. You could show how it's going to benefit the back of the box for the publisher and for the, uh, the marketing team. There's a lot of ways that your idea, again, can fit a certain audience's requirements. So keep out in mind when you're selling an idea, who wants it and how can I make them want it? One really popular way is to collaborate on this idea. So, Again, at the very start, I mentioned that these might not just be your ideas, it's a collaborative effort. So assuming that you're not the only person pitching this idea, you're going to be having a team to soundboard with, and you kind of collect those champions I mentioned earlier by working together on it. In fact, some of the things that I've seen approved in these uh, creative design meetings often come from having multiple fingerprints on it. It's not just one person's idea, it's multiple ideas combined together. So unfortunately, most of that is under NDA so I can't talk about it directly. What I have here is a kind of visual analogy. So let's say, for example, that you wanted, as a designer, you want a slingshot mechanic in the game. You want the ability to pull back the slingshot, hold it, and release it. You're interested in that kind of tactile feel. That's what you're pitching. Meanwhile, you know someone else in the design team is interested in some kind of toxic gas mechanic. They want to be able to fill an area that will damage the player and affect them, their statistics somehow. That's the idea that they're fascinated with. So you're pitching the, the uh, catapult, and they're pitching the, the, uh, the gas mechanic. And you might notice that the gas mechanic has no delivery system, and the slingshot has no actual effect. So instead of everyone arguing for different things, why don't both of you argue for the poison catapult, which combines both ideas together and makes them both kind of one united package that can be sold to the room. Of course, this does have some dangers. Uh, it seems like oversimplification, I know, but this actually does happen multiple times in game development. A lot of ideas you see get through are, as they say, the, uh, the camel made by trying to get a horse through a meeting room. And as before, these, this new combined idea feels fresher than the two ideas that are bouncing around the room. It feels like a solution. It's the creative jazz I was talking about. So now you've made something that the room feels as clever and new. Multiple people are behind it. And it's very easy to get that idea through the meeting room. You've got to be cautious, of course, that you're not doing this in a uh, pragmatic or callous way. The things that you combine should genuinely benefit both ideas. You want to make sure you're actually collaborating and being open to compromise. It's not just a case of using another person's idea as a vehicle for years. Instead, try and make sure that your idea is not in any way compromised by the combination of the two, and vice versa. Okay, so some uh, generic summaries beside this generic team meeting room graphic. Uh, as I said before, establish your core goals. Go back to the core goals of the game. Explain what your core goals, uh, goals sorry, of the actual team are right now. What are you all trying to achieve in this meeting room? Keep an eye that when in the room, who's supporting what idea, who's behind what kind of approach they want to take. 
Keep an eye on what people want and how that is changing throughout the room. Generally, you can kind of see, not just with body language, but with the verbal participation in certain arguments people have, who's interested in what, and who wants what to happen. Generally speaking, when people get one of their ideas shut down, they tend to go away and become a little bit negative for a little while. There's a lot of interesting conversations that happen and little miniature debates that occur in a meeting room. Keep track of who's on what side of those. Uh, if you can, I mentioned earlier that generally speaking in meeting rooms, people are reluctant to table the finale, the actual result, to a future time. But if you can do that, if you can give the, uh, the departments that require time to go away and research, you might be able to get a win out of that. I often find that if an engineer was supposed to say to me, no, it's absolutely impossible, I can't do it, and then you give them a couple of days, they come back to you and they say, I've already done it, actually it's done. So, Often, things that you think might be incredibly hard in the room turn out to be easy, and things that you think are going to be easy turn out to be incredibly hard. So if possible, let those teams go away and research rather than just having to defend themselves in the room with uh, bloated or inaccurate guesses. Okay, don't argue on subjective terrain. By this I mean, you're pitching an idea for a game, it is easy to extrapolate that idea out into the player's experience of it. People get into, into the weeds in this. They talk about the narrative or the feel that the player is going to experience. They talk about, you know, oh, well, what if the player does it in this room, etc. They start going into edge cases. Try and pull the conversation back to the core concept. Don't get stuck on the details. So for example, if you have the slingshot idea, don't get stuck arguing about how far the slingshot can shoot or how long the player has to charge it. These are all variables that can be tweaked later. The slingshot is the concept, it's the important thing. So be cautious that the conversation doesn't become too messy or drawn out, long-winded, because again, it will become a more and more old and annoying idea that, that collects a lot of negative uh, aspects to it and becomes tainted by that conversation. So where possible, Avoid that, keep it to the core goals, keep coming back to the core simple narrative you're trying to sell. And again, collaborate, be open to compromise. Have a listen to people because this might be uh, a guide of how to get your idea through these, in my opinion, unfair situations. But in reality, you're all working together. Do not just jam your idea through the development process to the very end. Continue to question whether or not the critiques that people are bringing you and the concerns they're bringing you, are they genuine? Because they very well might be. So keep an eye that you're not just becoming selfishly attached to this idea, which is one of the many toxic agendas that can occur in a meeting room, is that people become attached to one idea and they will make it happen at any cost, no matter all their ideas or all the aspects of the game that they are damaging, no matter how far away they go from the core goals of the actual project. So beware that you're not one of those people. This is a, meant to be a guide to assist you in getting past what I feel is not an unfair situation, but don't use it to uh, abuse the, the team. And then once you have it, once you have that green light, unfortunately that is not the end. It's only the beginning of the process. Now you've got some resources dedicated to you, some time dedicated to you. The, the team leads in power have said, yes, go away and you can make that thing you pitched to us. And then, of course, the development starts, and you might think, oh good, I started making it, there's no way they're going to cancel it now, but of course, a lot of very big complex systems have been cancelled right in the middle of development, so you're still not safe yet. Uh, Alois is only the beginning of the, uh, the, the defense process. Look, it is, it is over halfway through this uh, presentation. So we're doing really well for time. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. So, as we all know, when you're making a game, uh, it's not always very pretty. And in fact, usually game development, the, the games you're making are extremely ugly all the way up until like, the last couple of inches before the finish line. So as you're making things, their guts tend to be out all over the place. And unfortunately, you tend to have to... Sh Put them back in, facilitate it up, and then show it to people briefly, and then let the guts all fall out again. Just very briefly, just suck it in, get a good impression, and then move along. Because trust isn't free. People want to see what you're doing. They're going to review your in-progress stuff, and they're going to review your in-progress stuff. They're really going to take a look at it, and they're going to give you feedback on it as if it is a finished product, which means that Game developers tend to spend a lot of time having to, during development, rather than just develop the thing from scratch all the way to the end, constantly have these milestones where they have to make it look really good just for a second, or for a E3 demo, for example. Uh, and this is actually a time when feedback can get, again, very unfair. It can be based on misconceptions, it can be, be misleading to see the things that you've made. So, 
You've got to make sure whenever you're showing your prototypes, whenever you're creating a demo for people, uh, especially departments such as marketing or publishing or CEOs who've been either completely detached from the development or who are just never part of the development process, that you make it palatable to them. Not everybody has what I call the imagination goggles that allow you to see what an idea is meant to be like in the future. Often, uh, they can just look at what is there and they make assumptions that either it will not change, that it's kind of a, it's a, a real version of what you're meant to be pitching, or alternatively, they will do something much worse, which is they'll be inspired by the thing that, the, they, that you're showing them. And when they take that idea and they're inspired, all of a sudden they've got a new combined idea which feels very valuable to them, and then they want you to make that instead. And that's happened to me quite often. So step one, avoid that no one is confused. So whenever you're making something, and at this point, I'm going to try and bring in some anecdotes, despite all of the NDAs upon me. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you're making a level, and let's say it's level seven, it's late in the game, and there's not going to be any of the verbal cues, no dialogue yet, there's no people saying, hey, why not go over there? There's no tutorial text or prompts, there's no color coding, everything's placeholder assets. So, and the player is also missing like a whole bunch of experience in the game that a normal player would have had before this point. So it is easier for someone to come along to a demo with no guidance, none of the, lot of the, the guidance steps you're going to pile on later, and get confused playing it. And if they get confused or stuck and they can't progress, their opinion is going to be that it's too hard. And that's going to give you feedback about how, you know, the, for, for example, I once was working on a, uh, a boss battle. I believe it was Legend and Jago, Shadow of Ronin, the Ronin mech boss battle. And he didn't flash whenever you hurt him. He had no feedback. And the result was that whenever you were hitting him, it felt like you took a long time to die. And the feedback was lower his health. They didn't realize that actually what we should do is add a reaction. The health bar should be going down. The cartridge should be flashing. They just thought, this is taking too long, because they just saw the feedback problem. And it can be hard once people get stuck into that kind of feedback to convince them that they're wrong about it. And you end up doing a lot of things, like decisions based off that misconception. And uh, this doesn't just happen for finished, uh, sorry, sorry, for unfinished products. For example, also, if you make a finished game, as you know when players go to actually play it and you watch them doing it, it's incredibly frustrating. They don't know how to play it the way you intended. You tend to get a reaction a bit like this. You made a nice glass of water, and they just don't know how to drink it. So if possible, try and put in some debug tutorials. Try and help them to play it the way it's intended. It can be incredibly obvious stuff. If, if, if if all else fails, just put a debug text string in saying exactly what to do all the time. And if you know there's going to be color coding, etc., put some build notes on there, ideally in the actual game or in the video you're sending, point out exactly what's meant to be happening there, what is missing, and all the guidance that they need is in there so they can get through it. The next thing is asset blindness. Whenever they see placeholder assets, they might assume it is suggests something about the final version of the game. Or they might assume that Again, you're intending something in the place all their visuals like they imply. So they look at it, and because they're looking at a character who can, for example, throw a box with animation and the arm is just straight in the air, they might think it's meant to be a one-armed animation, and then they give you feedback not to do that. And it can be very frustrating to be swimming in all this unnecessary, misleading feedback based on the fact that they looked at the demo you made and they didn't quite understand what you were implying. One way to get around this that very few people actually do is to superimpose the final imagery alongside the demo. So if you have a level or an object or a character and you have some concept art for it alongside the, the placeholder 3D demo, put those images in there and say this is what it's going to look like at the end, by the way. Point out that it's missing things like VFX and sound. Frustration. So again, if you're working on something late game, like a boss fight, for example, and you're giving it to people who have not had the, the run-up experience to get into that boss and not played the game up to that point, then they might feel that it is overly hard or unfair. Again, especially if you don't have any of the feedback in place. So if you're at a combat system, for example, if you have enemies that are attacking you and their animations for starting up their attacks aren't finished, if they don't have warning VFX they're intended to have later, if they don't have that feedback to tell you you're, you're about to get hurt, then the game is suddenly way harder than it's intended to be. So keep in mind that if an unfinished game is being played, chances are that all of the little touches that make it not frustrating might not be there yet. And as such, it might be better just to balance it to be a bit easier for the demo player. 
If, it's going to, if you know it's going to be difficult to read enemy attacks coming in, less enemies, slower attack patterns, whatever you have to do to remove that frustration. Because again, if they get confused or frustrated, then it is tainted. There's a negativity about the entire thing, and they'll come away with a negative opinion of it, even if it's unfinished and that's an unfair opinion to hold. Uh, missing juice. Juiciness is game feel. It's the idea that whenever you do something in a game, there's a reaction to it. There's some feedback, there's screen shake, there's VFX, there's sound, there's friction. It gives you the feeling that it's satisfying to punch a uh, skeleton in the face. That's where you get that feedback from. And uh, some people might say that a good idea doesn't need juice to feel good. That might be, that might be true. But a perfectly good idea can have no juice and still, whenever it adds that feedback to it, will be a great idea. So, Sometimes you need to put in that little extra feedback to make sure it's satisfying. This is where the vertical slice comes from, because people know that without all the parts of the game, that demo's not going to be satisfying yet. So if you know that an idea, like a combat system, for example, needs some feedback to feel good, that might even be worth putting in to some placeholder feedback now, even if you know as a developer it's way too early for that. And I think a lot of the development team that aren't at that kind of review level, that aren't in these reviews, they don't understand why when game designers and leads come around to them and they ask them to add this placeholder stuff that won't be in the final game, when they ask them to move forward with uh, placeholder assets that we know we don't need yet, or we ask them to grab a video of their work from a certain angle and they don't know why we're doing it. It seems like a waste of their time. And in a way it is, but it's going to be a much bigger waste of their time if a review goes badly due to some misleading visuals or confusion or frustration, and you get feedback that ends up wasting the entire team's time. It's actually at this point that, indeed, it isn't your idea anymore. You might be the person bringing the idea to people to review, but actually you're now representing an entire team and you're trying to protect their workload. So at this point, it is important for everyone to gather together and give the demonstration the best possible chance at getting through a review without being changed. Because otherwise, the, the idea will constantly waver between different uh, directions and everyone will feel like it's not going very well and ultimately it could be for the chop. Some last stuff. Uh, don't send work you've not reviewed yourself. Ideally, you should be looking at all the work you send so you know if someone says, oh, it didn't work for me, the build didn't work, or it crashed, you know confidently, I played it all the way through, it definitely did work. Uh, ideally, you would be in the room all the time. Ideally, that's when someone's playing it, you would be nearby or seeing them immediately afterwards to explain anything that they experienced. That doesn't always happen. It's kind of awkward when people play a game and you're looking over their shoulder, they don't always like it. So. Ideally, you'd be there, but if you can't be there, make sure all the information necessary is in the package for them and make sure you know that it works. Once you do get feedback, it's very important to make sure you show you're listening to that feedback and reacting. If there's one wave of feedback that comes in and by the next review it's not being addressed, then you're going to start eroding that trust, maybe immediately. And if their little feedback points aren't being answered, they will start to micromanage you way more. They'll get way more involved. They'll say, oh, okay, you're not listening. Well, in that case, I'm going to be making sure that every line of my feedback is addressed every time. And you end up spending more time chasing feedback than you do developing the actual idea. If you just make sure you're responding to every feedback point as it comes in, then you can kind of gather a certain amount of trust. They know that when they review it, if they have a request, they will get it, and they tend to give you less requests under those circumstances. <clears throat> All right, as promised, 10 things. So we've gone through a lot of different stages of development here, a lot of different things that can hurt your idea. I've kind of rounded them up into a rough list of 10. So let's go from the top. Meeting room logic, or the lack thereof. Meeting rooms are unfair places for ideas. Overprotective backlash from a required department. So again, uh, I did talk about this once uh, with an engineer friend of mine about how meeting rooms are also very unfair places for what we call introverted thinkers. Departments actually have to create things. Easy for designers to turn the dime in the room and change their mind, but for engineers or uh, even like uh, people who are working with the tech of the actual game, tech artists, etc., they have to go away and actually work out uh, if something is possible before they say yes or no. And if you push for a yes, you'll probably, you'll probably get a no in the room because they don't have time to go and check it out. And they'll protect themselves because, unfortunately, if they were to suggest something that the team can't handle, it will then be their fault and their schedules will fail. Absorption of someone else's idea. If you attempt to callously use someone else's idea as a vehicle for yours, you might find that your idea has to be compromised to make theirs work, or it might, you might find that it becomes unimportant. So, for example, using the poison catapult suggestion, uh, if the 
Poison gas, like the catapult is made first to deliver the poison gas. If that development time takes too long, then the poison gas might just fall off the schedule completely. So sometimes an idea is just taken by one idea as a vehicle and then wasted. Uh, misunderstandings becoming concerns. So when people see something in a demo and they think they uh, understand what's going on and it's negative for them, the idea is tainted by that negativity. But way worse, they're inspired by a misunderstanding. They think it's meant to be something that it isn't. And then all of a sudden, like, well, why isn't it that thing, actually? And once it becomes their idea, they will start defending it. And they, unfortunately, are above in the hierarchy. And that is always very dangerous for the initial concept of the idea. Uh, development delays. If an idea stays in development for too long, uh, I think the previous speaker had a name for it, quicksand features. If that happens, uh, the idea tends to, as he said, gets cut because it's taking too much time. People, even if you agree to a certain amount of time for something, if you say, for example, it's going to take three months, you might find that two months in, people start looking at that corner of the room and saying, what's going on over there? I know it's a bunch of resources we're not using right now. So whenever something is in development, it's always at risk of, being, of uh, being reviewed and changed or cut. In fact, uh, one of my biggest tips is always just to get it done as soon as possible. The longer something is in development, the more at risk it is. Once it's finished, it tends to be banked, and there's a certain amount of sunken costs, and it tends not to get cut at that point. Although, again, never completely safe. Seven, uh, bad timing. So uh, big studios tend to have uh, moods that change throughout development. I, I, I describe it as a pendulum, where at one point they're like, oh, this looks to be way too much work going on, and then they start cutting things, so eventually they go, oh, this isn't impressive enough, people are going to hate that in reviews, and they swing back to trying to add more impressive content, they keep going back and forth. And during the swing up to, oh, we've got too much stuff going on, the schedule needs to be cut down, all of a sudden everything at the fringe of the concept that isn't 100% necessary starts to get simplified or cut, and then when it goes back up to more complexity, people tend to start leveraging more content content to the existing ideas, and then all of a sudden, whenever it swings back to the uh, cutting phase, those are the ideas that get cut again. So it's a, it can be an awful uh, swing back and forth. It's important that you kind of have a rough idea on the pulse of the company. Are they in a cutting mood? Are they in adding mood or somewhere in between? Are they particularly against a certain type of development right now? For example, they're cutting all the, the traversal features to simplify the game there. So unfortunately, an idea can also be failed just because it's part of a larger change in the company environment. Eight, discussions you aren't part of. So basically, I mentioned earlier about the meeting rooms. The worst possible thing would be that you're not in the meeting room at the time when they're talking about it. No one's going to defend the idea. Uh, that you, you've been pushing better than you are. Chances are that if someone in a meeting room that you're not in starts critiquing the idea and pushing to get rid of it, there won't be a second meeting where you get to defend it. It will just be removed uh, ad hoc. Which brings me to nine throwaway comments from the boss of your boss. The CEO or the publisher or the owner of the IP is just wandering through the office, plays something, doesn't like something, and then it's gone because no one's going to argue for that, that, that idea for you. Someone's nodding there. Thank you for the support. <laughs> and 10, your idea could be the problem. So again, in this entire talk, we've been kind of going under the assumption that your idea is genius and it deserves to live. You know, that you've been unfairly treated and your idea has been unfairly hurt by the, uh, the swings and roundabouts of game development. But it could be that you should let your idea change or die for the good of the, pro of the product and the project. I always tend to th throw in a little bit of anti-crunch philosophy here. It's very important when you're pushing your ideas, when you're trying to get things through the team and improve the game, you keep in mind that the most important thing isn't the game, it's the team. Don't use these techniques to try and push through an idea to a team that you know is overloaded. Don't try and trick people. You have to be really cautious that whenever you are pushing the game, that it's only within the time that you have available. If someone says to you that you don't have the time resources to do it, you should take that seriously. Further, perhaps your idea does not benefit the core pillars of the actual game. Maybe you're attached to this thing because the way you see it in your head, that's a personal connection that no one else has. It doesn't have the value that you think it has. And uh, finally, again, video game development is collaborative. So you can't just hammer your ideas through past everybody else's. You have to have a signboarding process where you listen to people. So it could be that the thing that kills your idea is that it's just not good enough or it's not right for this particular situation. Uh, and I believe that is the end of my slides. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's time for the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Don't forget there's a prize or best question. Do I, I, I get the pick. Do I get to pick the best question? 
I do. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, so you were talking about uh, preparation before the meeting. Uh, what's your take on uh, backup pitches? So uh, say you are pitching uh, um, a battle royale in space, and then someone says, I don't really like space, and you, aha, underwater battle royale. <laughs> and uh, then you pitch uh, that. So it's basically the same idea with some 3D movement, but uh, you uh, dress it up a bit different. Cool. So I didn't, I didn't catch the question portion. I do uh, agree with you, though. <laughs> do you, so, do you so, the so, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's the amount of preparation uh, should be done? Uh, sh should, should you uh, prepare uh, <clears throat> more, more fuzzy pictures, which can be uh, polished up uh, to... Uh, oh, I get you. You're talking about backups. Yes, yes, right? yes, backup. So yeah, basically, uh, if you use your example of, of uh, space and then underwater, probably that compromises your idea, right? You won't be able to do the things that you wanted to do. So I probably wouldn't create a backup that extreme, unless your goal is really to make a game, any game. So what I would probably do is, uh, I know usually, I think we all know as game designers when we're pitching an idea, we know what parts are controversial. We know the easy bits that are kind of similar to what everyone's doing already. And we know the, the bit or the bits that we know are definitely the, the big things, the big swings. And uh, I usually do have a few backups, a few kind of modular levels of each uh, of those particular pieces. So if someone has a concern about it, you can kind of gradually dial back to the simpler and simpler versions of it. So I do tend to go and prepare it that way, but of course there's a point uh, whenever you should cut your losses because your idea is essentially dead. Whenever you layer back an idea so much that it just barely uh, exists, doesn't achieve what you wanted to originally, you might find that when you see it all the way to the end, people go, it doesn't seem like a very good idea. And then you go, well, of course, that's not my idea. That's like a tenth of it, it's a tiny piece of the idea that I intended to reach the game. That's happened to me several times. A lot of unfinished systems that function in the game, but don't have the key pieces necessary to make it work the way you want it. So I do have backups, absolutely, but there has to be a limitation to it. At some point, uh, when the idea is uh, so degraded down, you might as well just drop it. Yeah, at that point, you should cut your losses. Uh, about, about losses, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, there are times where you didn't push through your idea for, uh, at the first time, then you try a second time, and then it becomes uh, uh, a chore for these people that uh, listen to your idea, and they, uh, they are not ready to uh, accept it in any, any way because they are tired of your idea because you're pitching it too, too much, too, too many times. Do, do you have any uh, antidote for, for this? Uh, I mean, this? yeah, not, not should, to, uh, should you uh, cut it on, on the first uh, time when you fail on, uh, or should you push for the for, for first I, time? I always feel that you really get one, one chance. Because uh, once you have that no, it, it, it can be very difficult to bring it back to the table. It's tainted now with that negativity. And this is kind of some of the rationality I was talking about earlier. Situations can change and make the idea all of a sudden more suitable. But actually, if it's had a no already, bringing it back is the idea that was turned down. So, in fact, sometimes I, if I know that the idea isn't quite suitable for the current environment of the game, I'll hold it back until I think it's time for it, that it could be approved. Because I do think that once it's got a no once, it is kind of tainted, and it's harder to get it through. And uh, the only way really to bring it back is to bring it back uh, in a new way. So I mentioned earlier about how new idea, ideas feel fresh and old ones don't. That's exactly what you're talking about here. It's an old idea now that you've talked about before. No one wants to hear about old ideas. They want to hear about new, fresh, hot stuff. So if you want to bring an idea back from the dead, I tend to try and have a little twist to it. Maybe it's in a new context. Maybe that's enough of it. Maybe. Uh, it's now, again, it's benefiting someone else's idea of making that work. But uh, yes, generally speaking, once you get a no, that, that can just have the idea just tainted forever. I mean, I, I have seen them come back, absolutely, but ideally you get approval the, the first time, the first swing, because uh, after that it's much, much harder. Uh, thank you. Okay, any more? Hi, I want to ask you a question about pitching um, really original ideas, ideas that uh, can be found in other examples in the same medium or maybe in other mediums. Mm -hmm. uh, because I often encounter the situation when someone asks me, uh, look, 
it, it sounds like a good idea, but may, maybe I don't buy it. Show me an example. Was it done in another game before? Or maybe um, is it relatable in, in a movie or in a book? Do you, uh, can, can you give me an example like that? And in many cases, I feel that really original ideas are new ones, ones that don't just copy other uh, works. And uh, it's really hard to prove those ideas without a prototype, for example. But in many cases, I, I don't get the chance to even get to the prototype stage. So do you have um, like an idea how to pitch those very original, fresh concepts like when you want to be ahead of the competition and not behind them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's, there's two things to say here, basically. So firstly, if you want to demonstrate an idea, you mentioned earlier about a demo, etc. Perhaps it doesn't have to be playable. Generally speaking, if you're pitching to someone to make this game idea, they just need to see the, uh, the potential experience in it. So for example, uh, they have the concept of new X, which is the user story. What is the user going to experience? So if it's a new idea, they can't look at a, a previous thing and compare it, then you just got to make a new story. You got to explain what the player or the user is going to experience as they go in. What is the first thing that happens, the second thing, etc. Walk the people through what the intended experience is meant to be. The second thing is perhaps you can go outside of games and find some reference from movies and TV shows. Like maybe you can find something that gives the same kind of feel or approach you're looking for. And the other thing is, if you want to give an example, it doesn't necessarily have to be playable. It could be a storyboard or a video that gives a kind of the flow of how it's going to work. Uh, you have to be able to, basically, if they can't fill their mental canvas with an existing image, you just got to be able to build one for them. And that is much harder, obviously. I mentioned earlier about proof of concept. Whenever you pitch an idea verbally, people tend to be inspired by it. Whenever I'm starting boarding with other designers, often they get a new game idea from any game idea that I'm pitching. So I think the best thing to do is to try and bring enough visuals and enough kind of step-by-step -step flow information that they can build that idea in their head and understand it. If they're explicitly asking you for existing stuff, then sometimes the combination of reference can work. But uh, yeah, ideally try and build up your own specific image using storyboards or videos, or if necessary, just a, ver a really passionate verbal narrative. Do we have more questions? <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> Show yourself. <laughs> yeah, you can just yell it. It's fine. I have my sort of confession. I love to hear stories, to be honest. And I assume that if you propose this kind of presentation to us, you for sure ask many of us to face with new ideas, present new ideas. Do you reckon with the, the idea you really think was the awesome idea you had? You mean if I ever had a, you want an anecdote, basically? I know everybody wants more anecdotes. Unfortunately, a lot of the projects I'm on are under com confidentiality, so I'll try and think of something. You're looking for a story where something I think is truly awesome has been pitched and has not happened, yeah. right? So, interestingly, actually, the majority of really like big crazy stuff that I've pitched has been approved at the meeting room stage. Almost always, the pitches work. It's an in, de in development. Usually they, uh, they're worn down by the process of reviews, and as development time goes on, they, they get deprioritized. The cool parts get deprioritized and brought in more and more. I did a green light presentation once for a project, and there was a brand new huge system in place there that was theoretically greenlit. It was similar to a, a system we had in a previous game, but much larger. And throughout the development, it eventually just became the original system <laughs> that it was based on, again, with like a few uh, visual tweaks. So I can't think of an example where I, I was uh, shot back at pitch stage. I've been pretty successful with the pitching. But uh, then at the development level, it, uh, it was worn down by the realities of the resources, which I guess is really my bad that I didn't see that we couldn't achieve it with the resources we had. But uh, yeah, I can give you an actual example I can think of that I'm approved to talk about. But yeah, that, that happened to me. It was worn down and down until it was basically what we started with, which was uh, depressing to see. Anyone else? Any more for any more? 
okay? I guess it was our com competition entrance then. <laughs> I have to pick the best question. I'll, I'll, do, it, I'll do it off mic. Yeah? Oh, okay. There you go. You're the winner down in the, bot in the bottom row there. You win a Pebble Power Bank from Sparrowsoft. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen <laughs> Thornton. Thank you.